Yeah, hi everyone. I hope you are doing well and are well prepared for the exam on Tuesday. I just want to clarify again, these stuff in the news videos are not topics of the exam. So you can just watch them and entirely forget about them if you want. And you don't have to watch them at all, of course. So today, um, because we have an exam on Tuesday and an, I have another talk on Wednesday, I will try to keep it rather short. I will mainly introduce a new self-supervised learning technique I found. Then there is something about some of the challenges in deep learning related to causal relationships that I wanted to share with you. And there are also a few tools I found really cool. Um, for instance, a PyTorch profiler. All right, so with that, let us get started. Yeah, so the first cool thing I wanted to share with you is a cool podcast I discovered this week. So I'm not listening to as many podcasts anymore as I once did, because sometimes I think it's good to give your brain a break, especially like if you work and study a lot, and it's good sometimes just to maybe do sometimes nothing and give your brain some rest. But if you're doing something boring, let's say commuting or household chores like cleaning up at home then yeah sometimes it might be nice to make this a little bit more interesting by listening to some yeah interesting podcast so this podcast is about machine learning uh just came out this week it's um by peter abiel who is a uh, yeah, very well-known researcher in deep learning and it's a style of interview podcast and there's only one episode out but in this first episode he was interviewing andre kapati who is um the director of ai at tesla and um, they talked about, yeah, mainly machine learning and deep learning and how it is like to work at Tesla. So I found this very interesting because they were also talking about, yeah, how deep learning is used in practice. So at Tesla, they, for instance, use deep learning for their um, autopilot, which is some sort of semi-automatic um, self-driving or semi, yeah, semi-self-driving -self car capability so where the car can drive automatically on highways but they also have uh, recently extended this version to a beta version that can drive also in yeah non-highway situations and they're mainly using cameras for that like regular cameras mounted on the car and um, they are using under the hood for instance uh, convolutional neural networks also and one of the interesting takeaways from that interview was that um, Andre Kapati mentioned that, for instance, it's a better bang for the buck if you want to improve your model, if you collect more data and you are, let's say, labeling your data. So paying attention how you label your data and also what type of data you collect that might improve your model more or the performance more than, let's say, fine tuning or trying out a different model. So sometimes just focusing more on the data side can also give you really, really good results. This is like a very common pattern I've seen in industry. For instance, I recall also Andrew Ng, who is uh, now, he was a um, professor at Stanford, who also was the co-founder of Coursera and had these very popular machine learning classes that I also took and really enjoyed online. Um, so he also has a startup company, or I think it's beyond startup now, it's a relatively big um, company, focused on working with industry partners and also from things he talks about um, I gathered that yeah the focus is also really on the data it's very important to get good quality data and if you want to improve your models yeah just focusing on the data is um, is really important compared to just tuning the model which is very different from academia for instance in academia we usually work with benchmark data sets because usually when you look at paper or papers it's like um about improving on a certain benchmark data set like MNIST, Cypher 10, ImageNet and many others. So you are using the same data set and just want to see which model performs better. But once you leave the academic situation and you go into industry and you want to develop real products, it's then more about um, yeah, also collecting additional data and um, not just tuning the model, but really um, yeah, collecting more and better, more informative data to improve the performance of your application. Okay, this was like a, a long tangent. Just wanted to mention this was a, actually a pretty cool podcast I liked. So if you're interested, yeah, feel free to check that out. Yeah, so this week I also discovered a new self-supervised learning method I found particularly interesting. So if you recall, self-supervised learning is essentially about leveraging the feature information or the structure of the data 
for a supervised learning task. Usually that's done by yeah, creating some label information from the data. So you can apply self-supervised learning to unlabeled data and then train in a supervised fashion by creating labels. Here, this is a little bit um, more focused on, I would say, the structure of the data. So there is no, I would say, explicit label information created here. It's more about yeah, the structure. So this method is called Barlow Twins. And the paper is titled Self-Supervised Learning via Redundancy Reduction. So how that works is that essentially they run a network twice. So focusing on this figure here, let's say this part is one network and then they create a copy of that network. So let's say the lower part, it looks the same as the upper part, except the input is different. So, but here it's really just an identical copy of the network. It's the same as running the same network twice. And this setup in general is sometimes also called um, Siamese network. It's also yeah, popular in other contexts, for example, uh, traditional face recognition and so forth. So in any case, so what uh, the goal here is essentially is to learn feature representations that ignore small modifications of that image. For instance, um, changes in the brightness or slight color perturbations or slight rotations of that image. So what they do is they provide an, uh, let's say this is the original, the original image. And let's say this is the dis distorted version of that image where you, for example, make everything a little bit brighter, you change the brightness. Then you run this uh, through a convolutional network. So you run both of them through a convolutional network, the same convolutional network, and it will create a feature representation. And then you have the feature representation of the distorted one up here and the one of the original one here. Or it could also be two different types of distorted images. For instance, this could be um, slightly rotated to the left and this one could be slightly rotated to the right, for instance. The, the point is here really that you have two images that are similar and then you get these feature representations here at the end and you compute the cross correlation matrix and you then try to make the cross correlation matrix similar to an identity matrix where you have the ones in the diagonal. And so with that, you're trying to learn essentially, um, yeah, you're trying to learn that these feature representation vectors should be similar to each other. So it should ignore, the network should ignore essentially the small perturbations in that image. So yeah, here I summarized it essentially that um, they run the original and the distorted image through the same network, compute the correlation matrix, and then they have an objective function or loss function that forces this correlation matrix to be close to an identity matrix. Yeah, and that is um, essentially then forcing the representation vectors of similar examples to be similar. So here is the code, the PyTorch style pseudocode for that. So I found it actually nice that they included that in the paper. So here that makes it um, yeah, easy to implement. So here they produce two augmented version of the image, um, then compute the representation vectors where F would be then the neural network. Um, then they compute or they yeah, normalize and then they compute the correlation, the cross correlation between the two. And then they compute the difference between the cross correlation and an identity matrix. They apply a uh, square. So they square the results because, um, yeah, to, so it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, which direction, so it doesn't matter um, which, which way it is, right? Um, and then they multiply it by uh, lambda, the difference the off diagonals. So I guess it's a hyperparameter, um, like a scaling, how, how much penalty you would assign. I'm not sure if that actually is really necessary because to some extent I would think that the learning rate already takes care of that by scaling the gradients, but I guess it's a little bit more control over the penalty here. And then they sum up the off diagonals here and essentially you want to minimize the difference between those and the identity matrix. And yeah, this is then the loss that they optimize. And that's all they do. There's no class label information and they train that method. And then when they obtain these uh, feature representation vectors, they train a linear model. So they say linear evaluation. Usually that's something like logistic regression, some simple linear generalized linear model. And when they apply then the linear evaluation or 
let's say logistic regression trained on the feature vectors they get a pretty good accuracy here which is shown here so let me maybe draw that so if you have your input image let's call that x it goes through the neural network the convolutional layers and then there's this uh, feature representation vector and they let's say produce all the feature representation vectors for the whole image net so you have these you treat them as fixed so you have for the whole image net these feature representation vectors and they are your axis your let's the x the feature input x for the logistic regression model so let's draw that here so let's call that x1 for the first training example and let's say x3 for the third training example x2 for the second training example but then you also use the original class label from ImageNet and this will be this whole thing will be your training set your new training set for logistic regression it's essentially a traditional supervised classification problem so why why would you do that this is really yeah it's really testing how much information about the images is captured in these vectors it's a way of evaluating the convolutional network feature extraction in, in that sense so here the hypothesis is essentially um, by forcing the network to ignore these distortions you can produce essentially representation vectors that are really representative of the image and then the linear classifier can yeah, classify them uh, well and you can see this method when you train it uh, in that manner with a logistic regression on these feature representations gets a 73.2 percent top one accuracy on ImageNet and 91 percent top five accuracy and there are also some yeah, other methods for comparison this is not the best method so notice there are two methods here at least that are better but um, it's very competitive uh, it's it's performing really well here and what i like about it is it's pretty simple if you look at this it's a pretty simple training method and um yeah simple is sometimes also good it's actually pretty cool i think yeah so one thing that is great in our day and age is that we have all these technologies now that make communication online easier but yeah one uh, unfortunate downside of that is it's also making cyberbullying easier and other abusive yeah things on the internet so it's actually nice to see that there is now like a workshop focusing on issues like that to improve the identification of hateful memes for instance so i think this workshop was um, organized by facebook i'm not sure anymore by facebook ai research i think but um, i would have to double check so here are a few examples of that and essentially this is a competition where everyone can participate and develop models and it's a workshop where you're then invited to also um, yeah write a paper about your model if it's uh, performing well um, i wish i would have known about that earlier because then i think we could have made this a class project it would have been cool but yeah it's just it was just announced last week it's a little bit um late in the semester but if someone is interested in working on that as a side project this would be an interesting application for instance also of convolutional networks so um one thing that is new about this is it's a multi-label problem i mean not new in the general sense but in the context of our class we haven't worked with multi-label problems but it's essentially pretty straightforward so let's say you have your output layer of a neural network convolutional network or multi-layer perceptron usually what we used was a softmax function such that these um, outputs that they sum up to one to a probability of one so we have a each each node is a class membership probability right so the first one is a let's say for class zero given the input this is for class one given the input x and this one is for class two given input x so usually we assumed these were exclusive mutually exclusive classes for example in mnist each digit can only be one class right so it makes sense if we have three membership probabilities for let's say a digit one digit two and digit three that they sum up to one um so if for instance if you have 90 percent probability for label one then it's maybe five percent for label two and five percent for label three 
But um, yeah, in a multi-label problem, it's it's not a requirement. So a data point can have multiple classes. For instance, here for each meme, um, one task is to predict the protected category, for instance, race, disability, religion, nationality, and sex. So um, a meme could, for instance, target multiple things at once. So here you're not constrained of having probability summing up to one. So for instance, you can say for class one, it could be, for instance, a 90% probability, but it could also have a 95% uh, probability that it um, has, in addition, also the label number two. So it can have multiple labels. How do you achieve that? So the only thing you really have to do is you just change softmax by the logistic sigmoid function. So in that way, you don't constrain the network to have these probabilities summing up to one. But essentially, yeah, this would be a very similar approach. You can use convolutional networks for that. So yeah, if someone is interested, um, here are the important dates. Here's a link to this workshop. I just found that interesting. I wish, yeah, we would have known about that earlier because then it would have been a cool class project but now yeah i don't want to you spend already so much time working on it i don't want to um, propose this as the new class project but if someone is interested uh, that would be an interesting side project yeah so there was an interesting paper recently towards causal representation learning it's not a new paper i mean it's relatively new but it's from last month but i have a huge backlog of stuff in the news items that I discover and haven't had a chance to discuss yet. So yeah, so essentially this is about pushing deep learning more towards um, yeah, causal representation learning. So one shortcoming nowadays is that deep learning or the in, in general the current state of supervised learning and um, yeah, predictive modeling is more reliant or is essentially reliant on IID data. That means uh, independent and identically distributed data where one data point doesn't really influence the other. And deep learning systems like classifiers, typical classifiers are essentially just learning um, yeah, statistical correlations between the input data and the output data. So you're essentially not learning a system that can really understand the relationship between the data in a causal way. It's more like exploiting yeah, correlations. So for instance, um, why would it be useful to learn causal relationships? One aspect that is also kind of mentioned in that paper is it can make models more robust towards unexpected situations. For instance, um, if you have, let's say, a self-driving car, and uh, remember when we had, I showed you that before this adversarial attack where they had a laser beam uh, in or in front of a street sign and it was fooling the classifier into thinking that the street sign means something differently. If there would be a better causal understanding that might uh, be avoided. So in that way I think um, certain adversarial attacks could be mitigated if the network had a better understanding of causal relationships. But also it can make training cheaper. For instance, let's say you train a classifier to detect objects and one of the classes is let's say predicting whether something is a chair to sit on. So usually, if you want to make this really robust, you would have to take pictures of that same chair and include it into the training data set from different angles. Um, a human, though, a human doesn't really need to see the same chair from different angles to recognize that this is a chair. So in that way, if the network has a better understanding, maybe what the what, what makes a chair a chair, then in that way, we would maybe require fewer training examples. And this would also help with repurposing models so that you don't have to train the model from scratch on each new data set. So in that way, um, it could be more effective maybe to train a model uh, on one data set and then apply it to another. For instance, if you think of reinforcement learning also in a grander scheme where you, let's say, learn an agent to play Age of Empires, uh, it's a strategy game, then maybe this agent could be applied also to play StarCraft, which is another strategy game without, let's say, requiring learning from scratch because the games are relatively similar. So in that way, it could also help with transfer learning and repurposing models. But yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's something where people don't have a solution for yet. So this paper was mainly highlighting the challenges and proposing some potential future directions. But yeah, the main challenges essentially are um, whether the data even reveals causal relationships and also then how can we infer 
these um, abstract causal variables. So there are currently, I think there are no solutions yet, but people yeah, started to think about it more actively. And I think that this is like an interesting area of research to keep an eye on in the future. All right, let's wrap it up with some of the cool tools I discovered this week. So one of them is Classify AI with a rather clever name, <laughs> AI. Um, anyway, so here this tool is essentially an image annotator. So there are some other tools that exist. I shared some of them with you in the context of the class projects before, but yeah, this is a newer one, I think, and it looked pretty cool. It's an open source tool. and. Yeah, so it is uh, providing capabilities for annotating images conveniently, for instance, also for object detection. So um, at the bottom here, this is a video. I hope it plays. Yeah, so it's just an example that um, shows you how convenient it is to label different objects. So if you are interested in that, check it out. Um, this is free. It's an open source tool. Another thing I wanted to talk about is yeah, making your code more efficient. So this week um, I actually spent uh, quite some time making some of my code more efficient because training was relatively slow and I had hundreds or thousands of lines of code and I was just finding or trying to find the bottleneck. Why is the training so slow? Eventually I found out my mistake or the inefficiency. It's kind of summarized here. So I was computing three things every epoch. I was, or well, actually six things. I was computing the validation set, mean absolute error, mean squared error, and uh, the validation set accuracy. And then I was computing the same mean absolute error, mean squared error, and accuracy for the training set. So I did that each epoch, and each time the way I implemented these functions was by iterating over the data set because they are too large to load into memory. So I was just iterating over the data set the same way you would iterate over the batches when you do the training. And I did that every epoch. Now that was very inefficient because it takes a lot of time. If you have like uh, half a million images in your data set, iterating over the training set uh, in each epoch that can easily like take two minutes or something. And if something takes two minutes and you train for let's say 200 epochs, that's 400 minutes, right? So it's a lot of time, extra time. And yeah, the downside of that was, or not the downside, but the problem I had here was that I did this in a very inefficient way. For instance, I computed here the train mean absolute error and mean squared error using iteration over the training loader. And then I had the same thing here too. So how I solved this problem was essentially um, writing one function that computes MAE, MSE, and accuracy in one one go. So I don't have to call this function and this function separately. I was just writing a function that can do both at once. So I would essentially save 400 minutes if one of these takes uh, two minutes each epoch and I was training for 200 epochs. And essentially I also decided just not to track these statistics during training only for the validation set and also it saved me a lot of time then, another 400 minutes. So in that way sometimes yeah, thinking about what you're doing in the code can be useful to make your code more efficient, especially if you don't really need the training statistics during training. If it's enough, for instance, to plot the final training accuracy and the final validation accuracy to assess overfitting. All right, so long story short, the main point I wanted to make here is I was spending a lot of time analyzing my code and trying to find bottlenecks. And then, yeah, on Thursday or so, I saw that there is a new tool a uh, PyTorch profiler that just came out. And this is a tool that kind of promises to make this more easy to identify bottlenecks in your code. And I thought that might, uh, might be interesting to you. So this is based also on a tool called TensorBoard. And TensorBoard is a tool, a visualization tool that you can use during training to track different things like um, performance metrics and so forth during training. So this also got me into a rabbit hole. So I found out about this PyTorch profiler, which I think is really cool. That might be something worthwhile trying in the future. And then from there I saw, okay, this looks like Visual Studio Code, right? And then I also saw actually that uh, last month Visual Studio Code uh, released some new capabilities or was updated to add an integration for TensorBoard. Before you had to use TensorBoard um, 
separately, for instance, in a web browser. Now you can use it directly in Visual Studio Code, so you can have your code and TensorBot side by side. And also one of the cool things about TensorBot is it can, instead of also in just, in addition to just tracking training statistics, it can also visualize the neural network graph. So that is also a helpful debugging technique to make sure the network looks like you expect it to look like that. You don't have any weird connections um, between layers that you didn't intend to connect. So that is a um, cool tool to check out as well, a TensorBoard. It's also free, of course. And uh, another tool um, that I saw recently is a tool for comparing different experiments. So previously, this TensorBoard is more for tracking during training, this is when you are training and you want to look at the loss function during training, for example. It's um, an yeah, easy way to visualize the loss. In class, the code I provide to you is usually that we use matplotlib at the end of the training, but TensorBot is really useful during training. I didn't want to um, teach that to you in class because yeah, we have already so many uh, things to talk about. And I would say this is more like something that you want to use once you are more familiar with the basic training because yeah, it's just another tool and I didn't want to overburden you with too many tools, but I recommend to check that out at some point. This tool here is a little bit different. It's more like for comparing models after training. So it's actually, I looked at the uh, how you use it. It's actually super simple. So you only add one or two lines of code and it will write a certain Python dictionary to a uh, to your hard drive and it will do it such that you can import it into this tool and it will allow you to compare between different runs. So if you run the model with different hyperparameters, it will essentially help you to visualize which one is the best hyperparameter configuration and so forth. It's actually a pretty nice tool here too. Of course, this is just one of the many, many, many tools. There are other ones like um, there's, for example, I think one is called Hydra, one is called MLflow. There are many tools for doing that, but yeah, this one looked actually pretty cool. Also, just wanted to share this because yeah, it's also free and also something you may want to check out at one point. Um, yeah, lastly, <laughs> so there I will be giving a talk on Wednesday if someone is interested. So they gave me free tickets for students. I shared them with you on Piazza. So if someone is interested, my particular talk would be on March 31st, um, 10.40 a.m. Central Time. I think that is um, 11.40 in our time zone. No, wait, this is our time zone, sorry. So this is our time zone, central time. No, I uh, used to live in Michigan where we were on Eastern time. So um, yeah, we are in central time. So yeah, if someone is interested, um, but in general, um, lots of interesting talks here. You can check it out here. So, and because there is an exam on Tuesday that I still have to prepare and I also have to prepare for this talk, I will now... Yeah, end this stuff in the news section and um, yeah, good luck for the exam on Tuesday.